District of Columbia. I have the additional privilege of being the ranking member of the New Columbia Statehood Commission. Uh, on behalf of our two co-chairs, Mayor Muriel Bowser and Council Chairman Phil Mendelson, uh, I'd like to welcome you all tonight and call this meeting to order. I'm going to begin by introducing my fellow commissioners and allow each of them to uh, introduce themselves and make any opening or introductory remarks they would like. Starting to my right, uh, my colleague, United States Senator Michael D. Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Strauss. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm proud to be the junior anything at my age, so um, I appreciate you conducting this meeting. Senator Strauss and I are both former ANC commissioners, so we understand how important the ANC is. Um, I was just telling uh, a commissioner from Ward 2 that uh, after 10 years as the United States Senator, I still get calls from my neighbors about how to who replaces the trash can and who do I call it DPW. So we know that people come uh, to ANC commissioners for guidance on all sorts of issues. And we hope that we can use this network of 41 commissions around the city uh, to push for this plan that the mayor's put together. And that's why we come here tonight to explain that plan to you. I think it's a good plan. I think that we've seen already uh, almost every day in the past two weeks, letters in the press, uh, letters in the post, or uh, there was an editorial in the post. Senator Strauss was on TV today. Uh, we've had four meetings in the last two weeks. Uh, already, the, um, this has ramped up our entire movement and our movement is uh, starting to get uh, momentum. And I think that's really what this approach has to offer for the statehood movement. I think uh, that we can get momentum from this and that uh, uh, if we can walk up to Capitol Hill in January with uh, 80 or 90 percent of the people of the District of Columbia speaking together in a clear and loud voice and walk to 16th Hundred Pennsylvania Avenue and uh, deliver these resolutions, I think it'll be a great thing for our movement. So I encourage everybody in the ANC to get involved. Thank you. Uh, our other member, United States Representative, the Honorable Franklin Garcia. Thank you, Senator Strauss. And so um, I'm uh, happy to see uh, the crowd tonight. Uh, when I got elected uh, a little bit over a year ago, one of the things I set out to do was to visit a lot of the ANCs so that, um, because I recognize the power you have in getting the information out. And because uh, this, a lot of what we're doing, it's, it's about getting information out. There's a process uh, in which that we're gonna go through and it requires that a lot of people get, participate in this process to make it so that the end result would be one where a message is clear. And so we need to have a lot of people participate in this process, so we're counting on you to actually get more people to be involved in the process. Very excited to be here. This is, I think, um, a good time to be working um, in the statehood movement. Uh, our mayor is leading effort to re-energize uh, the movement, and this is a good thing, and we should all um, try to see how we can come and, and cooperate and collaborate with the effort that she's put forth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Garcia. Uh, what we'd like to do now, because this is really a collaborative meeting of elected officials, is we'd like the ANC commissioners to uh, be recognized and to introduce themselves as well. But let me just start with Ward 1 and ask any Ward 1 ANC commissioners who are here tonight to uh, stand and please introduce yourself. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, ANC Commissioners from Ward 2. Hi, I'm William Kennedy Smith. I'm the Vice Chair of ANC 2AO. Tom Draper, Commissioner on 2AO5. John? John Fanning, Chairman, ANC 2F, Logan Circle. All right. Uh, commissioners here in Ward 3. Brian. Ward 3. Uh, good evening, Lee Brian Reba, ANC 3C01. My district is Woodley Park and the National Zoo. Thank you, Commissioner Reba. Any others from Ward 3? 
Commissioners from Ward 4. Columbia Heights. All right. Welcome, Commissioner. John Paul Hayworth, 4C07. Thank you, Commissioner Hayworth. Any other from Ward 4? Ward 5. ANC 5C Chair Jacqueline Manning, good evening. Good evening, Commissioner Manning. Thank you for being here tonight. Ward 6. Uh, Matt Levy, uh, 6A04, uh, Capitol Hill, Woods Park. Mm -hmm. Antonio Barnes, NEC 60 Thank you, Commissioner Levy, Commissioner Barnes. Commissioners from Ward 7. Patricia Howard, Chairman 7B01 Vice Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Robin Heaven Marlin, 7B05 Chair 7B. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Commissioners from Ward 8. Uh, Cheryl Lindsay, uh, 8 CL7. And in the back. All right. Thank you, former Commissioner Richmond. It's great to have you here. And what a good reminder to uh, uh, thank the University of the District of Columbia for hosting us here tonight. Uh, we appreciate that support. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, I've been asked to quickly recap the last two weeks. Um, and uh, before I do that, let me recognize uh, some people from the uh, executive office of the mayor, the chair of this commission, uh, the uh, one of the leaders in, in bringing this uh, uh, plan forward, our senior advisor to the mayor, Ms. Beverly Perry. Beverly? And I see, uh, I saw Eugene Kinlaw, Roberta Downing from the Mayor's Office of Intergovernmental uh, Relations and Affairs, and uh, they also had some other folks who are here uh, checking you in. We thank uh, you for all the assistance you've been giving this commission uh, and for your leadership on this issue. Um, in the last two weeks, uh, since the commission announced this plan, we have had a whirlwind of activity, beginning most recently with the release of the draft constitution that you have been given uh, tonight. Uh, this is an initiative that is designed to revitalize our statehood effort by rededicating ourselves to the vote that D.C. residents originally took in 1979, updating a constitution that was first written in 1982 and later updated in 1987, uh, and trying to engage the public and the community from our, all of our eight wards uh, and do outreach to uh, our fellow citizens here in the United States. Um, it will culminate in a constitutional convention in which literally every citizen of the District of Columbia will get the opportunity to be a delegate at that constitutional convention uh, and literally take advantage of modern technology so that uh, even if you can't personally be in a particular room, you can participate electronically, online, virtually uh, in a variety of capacities. Uh, we wanted to have a special briefing just for ANC commissioners because you are a vital and important part of our community. Uh, and in fact, just as the goal of this commission is to transform our mayor into the governor and our council into a state legislature, uh, the next logical step is uh, for you to become our county commissioners or uh, some form of uh, an evolving municipal uh, government. Let me just... Um, say that uh, uh, as it stands right now too, this constitution includes ANC commissioners and will make them not just a statutory office, but literally here a constitutional office uh, in what we hope will soon become the new state. Uh, we recognize the important role that you play and we want to continue that role uh, going forward. So without further ado, let me begin uh, this specific briefing so that we have a lot of uh, leaving a lot of time for questions, answers, and, and a good dialogue. Uh, first of all, as you've heard, the commission itself, composed of the three-member elected delegation, it's chaired by the mayor, it's chaired by uh, Council Chairman Mendelson. Uh, although this is clearly our biggest initiative to date, 
We were actually formally established uh, in 2014 by active council to try and bring some coordination and centralization to the uh, district statehood efforts. Um, and since the mayor has uh, kicked this off on Emancipation Day, I know uh, many of you were there, uh, we have been meeting every week to uh, move this initiative forward. The commission's developed a plan to basically <clears throat> redraft our statehood p petition and submit it to the president and Congress beginning in the first of the year. On April 21st, the commission voted to approve this plan uh, and on May 6th, just a few days ago, at the Lincoln Cottage, where President Lincoln actually wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, on that historic site, we released this draft constitution to the general public for consideration by all residents. How does this plan work? Uh, states are basically admitted for the most part when Congress passes an enabling act. Uh, and the way the District of Columbia's petition for statehood worked is we have been adopting something that uh, is affectionately known as the Tennessee Plan. Some people call it the Tennessee-Alaska Plan after the first and most recent territory to use it successfully to become a state. Rather than simply wait for Congress to administer us a state, uh, it is the District of Columbia citizens being proactive taking all of the steps necessary to qualify for statehood and then petition Congress to formally accept our admission into the Union. In 1982, all of the voters did ratify a constitution. Um, and we certainly don't mean to in any way disparage or suggest that there was anything wrong with that document, but it occurred at a very early time in the district's history. The home rule institutions that governed us were very, very new. Uh, and so it was very easy for district voters to take a more creative approach and essentially start uh, with a blanker canvas than we have now. Um, the whole idea of needing a state constitution is that the home rule charter as a governing body is not adequate. It is essentially a colonial document that basically is Congress's delegation of authority under the Constitution to the District of Columbia government, much in a way Congress delegates its authority over certain policy areas to federal agencies. It's not an appropriate way for a free and sovereign state to be governed. And so we as a state need to adopt a Constitution that will address and reflect the realities uh, of our current sovereignty. Um, This constitution uh, was drafted by a team of constitutional legal experts, law school professors, recognized constitutional scholars, and uh, some of the best legal minds in the District of Columbia. The draft constitutional booklet that we have available for you tonight is also available online at our website, statehood.dc.gov. And as early as now, any Washington resident, but in particular you commissioners, are invited to go online, uh, make comments, offer input. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing and living uh, vital process, and we want that public engagement to begin immediately. The culmination of this effort will be a vote that will appear on the November ballot, along with the president and uh, all of our other elected offices. Voters of D.C. will essentially be asked to answer these four parts of a question. One, do you affirmatively vote to become the 51st state? Are you willing to ratify this, our state constitution? Uh, will you approve the boundaries of this new state? And will you commit to a representative form of government? These four elements are required by the constitution to become a state. Uh, let me quickly touch on the idea of the boundaries because we know what the external boundary is going to be. They will be the outside borders of the District of Columbia, Western Avenue, Southern Avenue, uh, Eastern Avenue, etc. Uh, the interior boundaries essentially come by carving out an area that we now call today the National Capital Service Area. Now, instinctively, as Washington, D.C. residents, we know what the National Capital Service Area is. It is that federal part where the police force is different from ours. 
The grass is mowed by the National Park Service, not our own Department of Parks and Recreation. The trash is picked up by different folks. Uh, and if you ever buy anything in one of the stores, you'll notice that the District of Columbia isn't collecting any sales tax. There is an essentially federal part of the District of Columbia. It exists and functions very much the way the framers intended, a seat of national government. And we know from constitutional precedent that although the Constitution set a maximum size of the seat of government, essentially 10 miles square, which was an old-timey way of saying 100 square miles, not 10 square miles, but 100, we can shrink the seat of government. And we know that from the precedent set by retrocession in 1846, when Alexandria uh, was returned to the Commonwealth of Virginia. So if it's constitutional to shrink the seat of government to that part that was uh, smaller than what was originally set, we can once again shrink the seat of government to that part that really reflects the actual seat of government. Uh, and that's why we can become a state, and statehood is possible through congressional legislation and won't actually require a constitutional amendment. In terms of a representative form of government, sometimes called a Republican form of government, that's small r, Republican, by the way. Uh, yes, any state joining the union must commit to have a representative democracy. We cannot decide that the new state would be governed, for example, by a hereditary monarchy. Uh, we have to commit to a democratic form of government, just like uh, the other 50 states. Statehood is the exclusive province of Congress. Only Congress can grant a territory statehood, and the Commission's aim is to give Congress a complete petition for statehood and remove any of the arguments against it. So by meeting all the criteria in advance, we hope to preempt any arguments from Congress that we are not ready, willing, able, and capable of being a state. The Commission has adopted a very ambitious timeline to engage residents in every ward. We've approved a plan that will, uh, and has released a draft constitution, and we've established five working groups that will help guide the five members of the Commission throughout this process. What we're doing now is recruiting volunteers to staff these working groups. And obviously, our pitch to you as commissioners is uh, to help get you involved in the leadership of these groups. The five working groups are the All Eight Wards Committee, designed to make sure that our outreach efforts involve all eight wards, an All Americans for DC Statehood Committee to engage Americans outside of the District of Columbia. We have already had successful efforts in states like Iowa, Nevada, Hawaii, where on their own, residents have begun to organize around the issue on our behalf. We want to turn this limited state strategy into a 50 state strategy and make sure that all Americans outside of the District of Columbia are as committed to the struggle for equality as we are. Uh, assisting that effort will be an advocacy committee to bring not just uh, political activism but members of our business community, and communications community to help us craft our message and strategy and recognizing that this national election provides two unique forums uh, of nominating conventions of both political parties. We are targeting activities in both Cleveland and in Philadelphia at both the Democratic and Republican national conventions to make sure that that unique uh, national forum is a way to get our messaging out. The All Eight Wards Committee will include grassroots outreach, public education, and volunteer recruitment, uh, making sure that community members and volunteers attend not just our public engagement committees in all eight wards, but the Constitutional Convention as well. Our All Americans for DC Statehood Committee will recruit and establish advocates from across the country and leaders in every state to help bolster our grassroots effort. We want to engage national advocacy groups, alumni networks of DC colleges and universities, faith community think tanks, as well as international human rights groups to help us involve in that effort. And we're going to work with members of Congress around the country to help amplify the statehood message. The advocacy group will engage the business community in an effort to identify, leverage, and direct resources that enhance our statehood activities, as well as making the case for why statehood is good for business and necessary for growing a resilient District of Columbia. The Communications Committee will raise the profile of the statehood campaign and ensure public awareness, draft media materials, oversee press inquiries, and create a digital media campaign 
to promote statehood. And of course, the Cleveland and Philadelphia conventions will generate ideas, create plans that will be used to build awareness of DC's disenfranchisement at the national political conventions, and develop strategies that will invent, educate convention delegates about the continued injustice of denying DC statehood to the American citizens who live here. Our timeline. Uh, these working groups we intend to kick off this Thursday, May 12th. We hope to have organizational meetings beginning the 16th and the 19th. Uh, and on May 26th, the Commission will begin a series of public engagement meetings on the draft Constitution. On June 9th, working groups will meet to discuss and make presentations to the Commission. Um, and although these dates may change somewhat, <coughs> uh, you can count on June 18th being a big day when uh, on that Saturday we will be convening uh, our Constitutional Convention and looking forward to outreach and participation from as many citizens as possible. And then finally on June 24th, the Commission is again scheduled to meet and approve a final Constitution as well as legislation that's going to be submitted to the Council of the District of Columbia for the referendum that will go to voters in November. We have ward town halls, public engagement meetings, or essentially the beginning meetings of our convention that are scheduled to begin in each ward. In ward 1, that's scheduled for June 7th. Ward 2, June 6th. <coughs> ward 3, May 31st. Ward 4, June 8th. Ward 5, June 2nd. Ward 6, June 1st. Ward 7, June 4th. And Ward 8, also on June 4th. Other important dates. June 30th, we have to submit this resolution to the DC Council. Because it's going on the ballot, the Council, using their prerogative as our legislative branch of government, has to approve this and give it the force of law. By July 8th, this referendum has to be certified to the Board of Elections and Efforts that has to engage in its own process the way they would certify any referendum to the ballot. And they have to certify their referendum language by September 15th. November 8th, Election Day, where hopefully all voters will help deliver a big victory for statehood and for the other parts of this process. Uh, and on January 21st, there'll be a new president, uh, and we intend to submit this presentation and our petition uh, complete to a new president and hopefully a lot of new members of Congress that will be uh, ready to move forward and uh, take up this cause. How do you get involved? Easiest way, go to our website, statehood.dc.gov. Quick, easy to remember, find us on the web. Sign up and join a working group. Submit comments on the draft constitution. And that's the beauty of living in this exciting century. Anytime, day or night, log on and uh, start participating, as well as finding details about upcoming events. Let me just pause here. Uh, one, I'd like to acknowledge and welcome our council member at large, who also happens to be the chairman of the committee that has oversight over uh, ANC commissioners, Councilwoman Anita Bonds. Councilwoman Bonds. <laughs> Council member, would you like to come up and say a few words? Well, firstly, it's just. I'm, I'm going to ask that you use the mic for. Oh, all right. uh, both the amplification as well as the All right. folks watching at home. All right. Well, my goodness. Uh, what a treat to think that all of us are being watched at home. <laughs> and to remember that we're here because we're here on behalf of the various citizens that we represent. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you this um, evening and to, of course, encourage your participation. This is an important process I can tell you about the 1980s when we were beginning this process, but that would bore you. Let's be more contemporary and let's get involved, like I did many, 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 many moons ago. Um, if I could say anything that would be uh, your reward for your participation, just remember this is about your lifestyle. It's about where we should be as full vested citizens of the United States of America. Right now, we feel like we are. We travel wherever we want to. You know, we eat the foods of the different regions, but we're still not free. 
And that's what this process is about. So as you can see, in my younger years, I was a little bit of an agitator. And I want to agitate you tonight to step forward and to join one of these committees and to give it your full participation. We have a very short timeline, so it's really important that you uh, step forward in earnest and get going. I remember on Friday that the mayor said through um, Beverly Perry that every citizen in the District of Columbia is a delegate to this convention. Now, as one of those persons that was asked to help with putting together a convention, I've been racking my brain. How in the heck are we going to have 670,000 D.C. residents all in assembly? I guess we'll have to be on the mall in order to have our convention. But that really means that you as commissioners not only are commended for being here tonight, but you have some heavy lifting to do. You have to represent your 2,000 plus constituents, the kids as well, and to speak for them. And I hope that you will come forward and participate. And um, my regards go to this uh, commission because they've had a tall task and they have been toiling for many, many years on our behalf. And now they're asking us through this strategy to step up and to join them. And so I certainly encourage you to do that. And as I look across the audience, I see faces that know how to deliver. So don't walk away tonight empty-handed. Take an assignment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And before we get into the question and answer period, I know that at least, uh, I, I've seen at least two new ANC commissioners that have joined us, but uh, perhaps there are more. Uh, if you're an ANC commissioner and you've uh, come in after the port where we introduced ourselves, we would like you to stand up uh, and uh, be recognized and introduce yourself. I saw that there were two from Ward 8 uh, that I was able to recognize. Anthony Muhammad is here. Uh, yes, I'm here, Anthony Muhammad. Um, it took me a long time to get here from Ward 8 through the traffic. Next time, if I can get some lights, police lights, I can get here quicker. <laughs> but I guess that's why you held up and started at 7. So I got here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Paul, Thank you. Welcome, Thank Commissioner Jensen. And has any other... Yes, ma'am. I'm Tyler. I represent <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, let's open it up to questions. Commissioner Smith. Um, has there been a financial analysis done in terms of taxes and revenues uh, relative to this initiative? Uh, the question is whether or not there's been a financial analysis in terms of taxes and revenues relative to this initiative. Um, by this initiative, do you mean the fiscal impact of the actual ballot initiative or what it would mean to be a state? The, mm -hmm. um, the answer is yes. Statehood is not a new issue, and there have been many economic analysis done. The reality is that most people feel relatively comfortable in the idea that statehood will be an economic boon to the District of Columbia. First and foremost, uh, we waste a lot of money going through the process of being a congressional colony. The inability to budget the same way other states do raises the cost of financing. It makes it difficult for agencies to budget each year because you don't necessarily know what, uh, when your budget's going to be approved. Uh, and of course, uh, anybody who's lived here through one of the government shutdowns knows how ridiculous and costly that is. Secondly, uh, as someone, uh, as elected officials yourselves who understand the political process, imagine the fiscal impact of actually being represented in the national legislature. Uh, as your elected senator now, sometimes we're called shadow senators, our ability to deliver revenue to the District of Columbia is limited to say the least. Uh, we've had a victory here or there, but the reality is, is being not represented in Congress, cost the District of Columbia 
billions of dollars really in federal aid and support that we are not getting. And so while some have argued that we might lose some federal benefits, the reality is every territory that got statehood ended up doing much better within the federal government uh, in terms of resources. I mean, a classic example, the federal government doesn't even do a good job of taking care of its own property in the capital. The National Mall, used by more visitors than Yosemite National Park, actually receives less funding uh, even when it needed to be resodded after the uh, presidential inauguration. So we know that uh, this will be an economic boom uh, even without um, the need to uh, um, raise additional revenues through sources that we as a non-state can't necessarily do. Yes, sir. Uh, wait, can I add to that um, that we also can't tax income at its source? Sometimes we hesitate to talk about this because we know it's not popular with our neighbors in Maryland and Virginia, so keep it to yourself. But the truth of the matter is that in any jurisdiction in America, if you live in uh, New Jersey and you work in New York City or you live or you work in Philadelphia, you pay a certain amount of taxes which are rebated to you on your state and local income taxes. We don't get to do that. So we lose a lot of money by not being able to tax income at its source because more than 60% of our workforce live outside the District of Columbia. Yes, the question I would like to raise is, from the past years that we've been trying to get to this point, what, what, have, what strategy, new strategies that you all have or are being prepared so that we can reach this point of safety? Well, you know, I think, Paul, that, that uh, what this does that primarily changes uh, the dynamic for us is that it puts us on offense. We've been going up to Capitol Hill for a while uh, asking for this. Uh, Frederick Douglass told us that power can seize nothing without a demand. Never did, never will. This approach is actually making the demand going up there and saying, this is our right, and we want it, and this is what the people of the District of Columbia are saying with one single, loud, clear voice. Not retrocession, not uh, autonomy of this or autonomy of that. We want statehood, because it's statehood that makes us whole, and it's statehood that resolves all our problems. So it's a demand. The other thing is that we're using new strategies in response to changing times. We recognize that we are on the verge of a historic election that has the power to be transformative of our, our national politics. Uh, and so expecting that, we want to be ready and revitalized with an effort that is recent and reflective uh, and engages residents who may have come to the community uh, after our initial statehood efforts had begun. Yes, in the back. Commissioner uh, Schwaber. Um, Assumption is that D.C. would be democratic. Uh, what, what Republican trade-off would there be out there that would guarantee D.C. getting some support in Congress? <laughs> well, first of all, D.C. statehood is constitutionally permissible, morally and legally justified because we have sufficient population resources and meet all the criteria. Granting us statehood is in fact the right thing to do for the hundreds of thousands of Americans that live here. Now, I understand that when you talk about things like the right thing to do and equality for Americans, and you use it in the same sentence as the United States Congress, those of us that are familiar with the legislative body, in particular as they've handled themselves recently, uh, that there's a disconnect. That being said, it's not inconceivable that elected officials responsible for guarding and safeguarding the rights of American citizens are incapable of doing the right thing. It's happened before. Uh, but specifically, uh, our function is to demand the rights that we're entitled to. The Constitution doesn't say you have to be a member of one political party or another political party. Yes, we know that historically, beginning with the Kansas-Nebraska Compromise, whether it was debates over slave states versus free states, uh, or most recently with what was perceived to be the political balance of the Alaska-Hawaii trade-off, states have frequently been admitted to the Union in pairs or as part of a package. Uh, whether there's another state or portion of a state that wants to join the union is something that we in the District of Columbia can't necessarily take responsibility for. 
uh, but we do have an obligation to safeguard and protect our own rights. And so we, uh, when we have a new Congress, when we have a new president, we, we know we're going to have a new president. Most of us expect that there'll be a significant number of new members of the Senate, uh, and we know that there's going to be some new people elected to the House of Representatives. We won't know the numbers yet, uh, but we're going to be ready with a new initiative. And I think that's really what this uh, plan is about. And, and you should know that this is a very old argument. Uh, Senator Strauss brings up Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, they argued when they tried to get into the union that Alaska couldn't come in because it would always be Democrats and Hawaii couldn't come in because it would always be Republican. And I mean, there's one elected Democrat in Alaska. I'm not sure that Hawaii's ever elected a Republican. So those things change over time, too. And I think that's the way we approach that ar our argument. This is something that, you know, will never change in the District of Columbia. They never kick you out of the union, or they haven't yet, once you become a state. So those dynamics will change over time. Yes, Commissioner. This is a question in terms of uh, a lot of our, our members, our constituents, really have bread and butter issues. And actually, um, uh, having representation in the House and the Senate is not going to affect their bottom line. However, supporting the uh, Republican senator, I believe it's Gomer, who put forward that we shouldn't pay federal taxes right. Um, right. will really affect our bottom line and our pocketbooks. I mean, we don't have the industry. We don't have the financial support in order to support a state. And it seems as though it's kind of like an ego enhancement bill right. versus um, really benefiting the people who live here in the city. Well, with all due respect to Congressman Gohmert and um, his Texas constituents, the, he may be a proponent of that bill, but it's not really an offer on the table. So Congress is unwilling to part with the over $4 billion that D.C. residents contribute to the National Treasury. They are going to continue to take our money, whether we like it or not. Uh, and in order to grant uh, Representative Gomer's bill and exempt us from federal taxation, Congress would need to cut $4 billion from the budget. Uh, and they are not going to do that because reality is is that we provide more tax revenue than 22 other states and they like taking our money. So we don't really have a choice in that regard. The question is, uh, are we going to demand the same rights and privileges that other Americans who pay those same federal taxes get now? The reality is, is that when you join the union and you get federal representation, you get access to the federal resources and federal spending that obviously will probably make a difference to the bottom line of your, com your constituents. Uh, the senators from Alaska, for example, the most recent state uh, to use this Tennessee plan and it was admitted as our 49th state, were able to bring a whole bunch of spending and infrastructure to their state. Uh, that created jobs and helped the bottom line of their residents a lot. So I, I think it's um, misleading to think that if uh, Mike and I were voting senators, for example, that we couldn't do a lot within that federal budget to help bring home uh, our bottom line. And one of the problems that we face in the District of Columbia and that residents of urban America face around the country is that the Senate, let's face it, it's not exactly the most progressive and inclusive institution. It has very few African American members. It has, uh, doesn't reflect the gender balance of this country. Uh, if it was a country club that you were a member of, you'd probably have to resign from it before you actually ran for the Senate uh, anywhere else. Urban needs, urban issues, the urban agenda overall is disproportionately underrepresented in the United States Senate. There are very few senators that came from, represent, or even understand cities, let alone the needs of this city. And one of the things that granting statehood to the District of Columbia would do, it would actually strengthen the voice of urban communities on our national level so that uh, whether it's Detroit that's suffering economic problems uh, or uh, other parts of our area, the programming needs of people who live in American cities would be better represented at the national level. So I just have to disagree with you that statehood wouldn't do anything to enhance the bottom line. Uh, I think it would. 
and I think that we would be able to have the resources to govern ourselves and to direct our resources uh, in ways that we can't right now because we're not a state. And you know, I'd also like to say that as far as the infrastructure goes, we have a larger gross domestic product here in the District of Columbia than 12 states. So we have the infrastructure. We have uh, a mayor who acts in many ways like a governor. So we do a lot of the, lot of the, um, you know, we have, she has a lot of the responsibilities of a governor. So we do a lot of things that states do already. We have the, we have a bigger uh, infrastructure and economic engine than 12 states. And I think the $2 billion that we lose a year, which is approximately 15% of our budget, would help everybody's bottom line in the district. Yeah, let me just add yeah, real quick. Uh, I've actually joined uh, uh, Congressman uh, Louis Gormer on the floor uh, of the House. And um, uh, let me tell you that I've gone there about three times. And what he does is he does a little celebration uh, commemorating uh, that day. And um, if you see more than 10 people show up, that's a lot. And so I'm not clear that that's a real uh, proposal. I think it's a distraction, if anything else, because I haven't seen last year, he showed up and there were about, uh, I'd say about seven people, seven Republicans from, from the city. This year, he didn't even bother showing up. So I'm not so clear that he's really, he really means to, 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 you know, what he's putting forth. Yeah, it's a definite non-starter too. He's not the only person that's ever, ever proposed this. Eleanor Holmes Norton herself proposed it at one time. Um, it's an obstacle. Louis Gomart, uh, I think all of us agree, is no friend of the District of Columbia. Commissioner Muhammad. Yes, sir. Um, with the federal <coughs> land grab of the District of Columbia, how much land would actually the district control out, out of the 68 square miles that, that they have? Right now, the, the federal government is taking and expanding more and more and more in the city. How much would we control? And there are seven states that don't pay state tax. Seven states. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, the federal government owns property in all 50 states as well as other territories. Uh, in Alaska, for example, the, federal, the percentage of federal land is much higher than in the District of Columbia. Um, the way the federal district would work is, as I said, there's this pre-existing area that we now call the National Capital Service Area, where the federal government not only owns the land, but also provides the services to themselves. It's their own police force. It's their own uh, street cleaning services and so forth. So this would simply allow that to be maintained stay federal the way the framers intended, a seat of government under the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal government, and the residential portion of the District of Columbia, we would have control uh, as we do now. Yes, there would be parts of it that would be treated differently. The embassies would remain, but there are embassies to the United Nations and other parts in other states. There are consulates uh, in other states. Um, so there are plenty of important government buildings that exist in other states. The Pentagon and the Commonwealth of Virginia, NIH in the state of Maryland. So the way it would work is the federal government would still continue to own land in other states and, and the federal government would be able to buy land in the District of Columbia or the 50 other states, but we would be able to be independent of the federal government when it came to setting our own independent self-determination affairs. And that would really be the difference. The Arboretum, um, Beach Drive, all of that's federal. In every war, there's a federal enclave right. that the federal government maintains and controls. The federal government would be responsible for maintaining federal land uh, whether it was in the federal district or in the new state. Just like the federal government maintains, funds, and operates national parks and federal land in the 50 other states. So if you have a federal land, uh, federal government would still be maintaining that. There are national parks in the 50 states. There would be national parks in the 51st state. But the national mall, that area that is the central seat of government, uh, would remain under exclusive federal jurisdiction. And, and you know, you, this may surprise you, uh, Commissioner Mohammed, but there are several states where the federal government owns more property than the, a higher percentage of property than they do in the District of Columbia. 
uh, in the state of Nevada, for example, a single Air Force base takes up 30% of the entire state. Excuse me for yes, Commissioner. Maybe it went over my head. Um, the question that he raised was how much would the city own and what, what do we own and what we don't own? And I don't believe that question was asked. Off the top of my head, I don't have a square footage for you. But what it would change is the ownership of federal land would not change under the statehood bill. Some federal land would be located in our new 51st state, and some federal land would remain in the federal enclave. But we're not talking about transferring title over federal land back to the District of Columbia. Statehood would not affect that. So the answer is, whatever that number actually is, uh, it would remain unchanged by statehood legislation. And you know, there's a working group, Paul, uh, that's uh, working on boundaries. So actually, the answer to that question may not be available until we determine what the actual boundaries are. Will we not know that already, our boundaries? We, 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 we have a pretty good idea of it, yes. But there are some technical tweaks that need, need to be made. There's a federal district now. There's a statehood bill now that sets boundaries. Right. But uh, this process will allow us to take one more fresh look at that before we finalize it as voters ourselves. Uh, I saw some new hands in the back. You, you, you saw my hand, Commissioner Manning. Those numbers are very important when you start a meeting like this. So therefore, people have an idea of a guesstimated number that what we control and don't control. So having a, a group to work on it and then not, you're not being accurate as a, as a panel to say that, that's so important because those are the numbers that they're gonna have to work out that you want the commissioners to go back to have people to support this. So they have to have something to talk, talking points to have to go back to the community to support this. So how long before we would get the information to go out into the community to give this? Well, how, you know, long we, how long? What's our time frame that we're working on to get this out so we're accurate and not giving wrong information? Well, well we have a map already, uh, and, and I think we could probably get that up on our website, and that's going to be very, very, you know, that's very, very close. But again, the amount of federal land is not going to change. Some federal land will remain in the territory of the federal district and other federal land will be in the new state just like there's federal land in every new state just yeah um i just wanted to you know talking about congresswoman norton's bill um you know and th this has come up in a couple different meetings we you know the annual meetings we have and you know i'm part of a group the statehood coalition all volunteers that you know we've been working on getting co-sponsors now for years along with our shadow delegation um, you know, I mean, I know the bill, you know, that, that she has with the current borders, what is now the district, about 95 point something percent would become New Columbia um, under, under her bill. Now, I, you know, some of the things we've discussed in meetings with her before had to do with, for instance, well, what about Anacostia Bowling Base? That in her bill happens to remain within the federal district. It, it doesn't necessarily need to be. And if it weren't, that would obviously mean probably more like 96 or even 97 percent would be then new columbia there's also been some debate about what would happen to union station um there are little yeah. things that are right on the borders but i mean already the even now well yeah that would all be within new columbia there would still be federal lands but it would all be you know inside new columbia as opposed to the district the revised district yeah i just wanted to but i mean it's just it's a way to visualize how much you know, I, I wouldn't assume there's going to be a whole bunch of land transfers from the federal government. I mean, that all comes down to economics. You know, do we want to spend the money? Would we get a good deal? Would it be worth it? I don't know. I mean, that would just have to be case-by-case -case basis. Well, we're working on those details. Uh, Roberta from the Mayor's Office in Environmental Affairs. Can you repeat that one more time, please? It's 16.5 square miles is what's owned here by the federal government, and it's 24%. 16.5 square miles, 24% approximately. Correct. With the 24%? It's, it's federal land. It's federal land. So, Did you get the answer? So what about the no. circle parks? Is that... 
That's federal. Federal. I know it's federal. The Fort Circle Parks would that. remain federal parks located in our new state, just like there are federal parks like Yosemite located in the 50 other states. And, and let's not forget that they own 100% of the District of Columbia right now. They control 100% of everything we do. So. And, and additionally, right now, there's some areas of the District of Columbia that there's a partnership with the district and the feds. In other words, the district is allowed to maintain it. And then the feds can just turn right around and say, oh, sorry, we're going to take it all back. Yeah, and then right. that reduces it even more. Right. So these are things that I think need to be fleshed out. Um, additionally, why aren't we waiting until after the congressional hearing, which is going to be this Thursday, and find out what they have to say before we know what we're going to do? Because we're, that strategy of waiting for Congress to move or waiting and reacting to what Congress does has not served us well, right. is the answer to the second question. And as far as the first question, yes, there are going to be many issues that will need to be worked out, just like every other state works out its partnership with the federal government. But at the end of the day, when we become a sovereign state with federal representatives who could vote and represent us, instead of going to those negotiations without any leverage, we will be going with them on an equal footing. But we still don't have any leverage now. That's no, right. we absolutely have no leverage now, which is why we want statehood, so that we have the same rights and leverage that every American gets, including federal representatives with oversight over the funding and direction of those federal agencies. And, and we've had, we have the leverage that civil rights movements have always had, and that is that we're right. I mean, that's not an insignificant, uh, that's not an insignificant thing. 80% of America polled agrees that we should have the same rights that they have. So we shouldn't ignore the fact that, that above all, this is the right thing to do. Let me, let, let me recognize uh, Beverly Perry from the mayor's office to respond to, to some of these questions. I'm going to have to ask you to come on up and uh, make sure that the mic picks up what you're saying. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, let me just say, uh, I'm <coughs> someone said, ask earlier, what is new about this strategy? Uh, yes. L let me just tell you, if you think back to 2008 when President Obama was elected and when he entered office, we had, the Democrats had both the House and the Senate. There was a window of time if we had had our act together and we had filed a petition like we're talking about filing now, we may have gotten statehood. Because as Paul said, or the senator said earlier, um, only Congress can grant us statehood. So we are now looking at another presidential election where the White House will change. We are hoping that there will be the new president would be friendly to statehood. We plan to have that application as the first thing on the new president's desk. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the difference is from Mrs. Norton's bill, this is what we're doing is very consistent with what Mrs. Norton is doing. As a matter of fact, when, when the commission announced the plan uh, for launching this effort, Mrs. Norton issued a press release and applauded the efforts. And let me tell you how the two tied together. Mrs. Norton's bill that she introduces every year, she, the bill has provisions that say um, when Congress passes an act to authorize us to enter the union, within 60 days, the mayor will order an election. The mayor will um, convene a constitutional convention. All of the things that the senators are talking about, we are doing in this effort. Mrs. Norton's bill anticipates those things, and they would have to be done after the bill is passed. So what we are doing is we said, let's show Congress that we are responsible. We don't have to wait until after Congress acts. We want to have all of our ducks in a row. And if we're lucky enough that 
we have a friendly president and we have a friendly senator and if they pass an act, we will be a state immediately. There will be nothing, no conditions we will have to fulfill. There are four conditions to become a state. The people have to vote by majority and say they want to become a state. They have to ratify their constitution. They have to um, commit that they will have an elected form of government and they have to define their boundaries. What we are doing in, over the next six months are those four things. And those are things that were tried before. The bill was filed in 1982. The same efforts. But when the bill was filed in Congress and Congress didn't act, the bill died. So we have to do it again. So that's what we're doing. And you with, with respect to federal land, uh, I know Eugene and Roberta and uh, the whole federal affairs team because, you know, the federal government owns 24 percent of the land in the district. And the federal government, the National Park Service's budget has been cut, cut, cut. They want to give us some of that land. We would be in a much stronger bargaining position if we were bargaining as a state. We are negotiating right now with several agreements um, to get federal land back in the district's control. So federal land, we will definitely get more. All of the pocket parks, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the Park Service really does not want to maintain them anymore. They, they want to give them to us. So we would be in a much stronger uh, bargaining position to do that. Uh, somebody also mentioned, what are we going to give to the Republicans? It's, it's funny, this is the second time today somebody has said, I've heard someone say, uh, you all should do the same thing you do for your council members. You should reserve one of the Senate seats for a minority seat and uh, for the minority party. And that might strengthen our petition. We're going to file a petition with the president and the petition with the Congress, and they have to act upon it. So um, that's what we plan to do. Um, I guess those are the questions that I made. Uh, um, we just have a window of opportunity that the White House is going to change, and we know that there will be several new members of Congress. And we are hoping, as you heard Senator Brown say, you talk to people out in the hinterlands, they say, all of us, we should have an equal vote. And to me, the fact that the Supreme Court is right here and all of the debate that we have heard about the Supreme Court over the past few months, and we are probably affected by the decisions of the Supreme Court more than any other population, and we don't even have anybody in the room when they are discussing the confirmation of Supreme Court justices. I mean, if nothing else make this issue, just brings it to the forefront and make it a huge insult. It's the fact that the Supreme Court, we, we have a four and four Supreme Court, and the balance is going to tip, and we do not have a person, not at the table, we don't have anybody in the house. I mean, it's just hard to believe. You know, the only thing I would add to that, uh, which Thank Beverly you. just touched on, is that even if this doesn't bring us statehood, it's getting the issue out there, and it's causing us to have a conversation, and it's getting attention. In the same poll I referenced earlier, 80% of America thinks that we already have the same rights that they do. This is America's dirty little secret. We need to get it out there, and people need to understand that this is our right. It's un-American, it's undemocratic, and it's a political anachronism that has to end. Thank you.
And, and we talk a lot about, obviously, the Supreme Court, federal courts, but one of the big problems we have is that our own local court system, our state court, D.C. Superior Court, D.C. Court of Appeals, those judges need to be confirmed by the United States Senate. And right now, for example, there are three judges that are just sitting there because the Senate hasn't moved on them. And we have had several instances in recent years where nominations to our Superior Court have not been filled and that creates vacancies, and those vacancies create backlogs for those of you that have to litigate down there because we just can't get Congress to do their job. A job, frankly, they shouldn't have, a job they don't do well, and a job that for a lot of them they don't really want. Yes? I make a, major, I make a suggestion. I mean, I've seen the council member and them be willing to go up on Congress. Why don't we get all D.C.? Um, walk up on Congress here demanding all these things. Then, you, you know, I thought I would hear somebody make this statement. We have had an historical election, 2008, for President Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. and that, if, if that didn't change, say, we who, didn't have our position we, we, together. Right. We, we, we were uh, excited about that, and, and President Obama made commitments to those of us in the statehood movement and around that he would take certain action, and for a variety of reasons, it did not get us the results that we wanted from that. So we are not waiting for that, but literally, what you're saying is right. Every resident of the District of Columbia needs to get behind this effort, and the first way we do that is getting every resident of the District of Columbia to vote on this effort and declare publicly their intention to join the union as a state. So what better way to organize all of the voters of the District of Columbia on the one day when all of the voters in the District of Columbia show up and make their voices heard? And that is this election day. So on the same day we're electing a new president, we're going to declare our intention to and, be in the state. And let me add to that, Paul, that given the history of the District of Columbia, uh, I think we're going to elect a, a Democrat here in Washington, D.C., and I think we're going to elect a Democrat nationally this, this time to the White House. And I've talked personally to both, and Senator Strauss has too, and Representative Garcia, uh, I talked personally to Hillary Clinton in Iowa, and 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 Senator Strauss and I uh, just talked to Bernie Sanders, who's a co-sponsor of the statehood bill, and both Democratic presidential candidates stand firmly behind statehood. Some other questions, yes, Commissioner. Um, yes, there's a question that I'm sure that this doesn't take precedence over uh, why we're here and what we're trying to accomplish, but. Since it was bought up by a fellow commissioner in terms of the land and how much land would be incorporated into this movement, I have to speak on, as I mentioned, the four circle parks. And the reason why I say that is because if we're looking at um, the square, the mileage that possibly we would overtake if, if we become a new Columbia, let's just say the federal government to, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember her. Beverly Daly. What, what she said about uh, the Department of Interior doesn't want to take care of their land anymore. I, I don't find that to be the case in my neighborhood. I feel that land is owned by the district. It's constantly being developed. And if we don't save the parks, we won't have any green space. Mm -hmm. So I know this is at the focus of the conversation, but since it was brought up, my concern would be that those lands, those parks, are not given to the district. Because I haven't seen in my, oh, I'm sorry, in my neighborhood where that is the case. So again, I know it's at the focus of the conversation, but if it comes up, or if you have a committee that's looking at that, I think that that needs to be thought out. Well, let, let me just say, I think it was very unlikely that any park that we received from the federal government that would ever be developed. Uh, usually, um, when the federal government transfers land to the city, they transferred either with some conditions or with no conditions. Park land would be transferred with conditions, and it wouldn't matter whether it's to us or to another state, but at least we could maintain the park. We can make multiple uses in the park. There are things you can do uh, with park land other than just let it just lie dormant. Most of the park land in, that the federal government owns in Washington, it not only does it lie dormant, it's not well maintained. 
Well, right. I mean, uh, maybe in your we, neighborhood, we can, but... L l let me be clear about something. The National Park Service is an instrumentality of the federal government has seen their budget cut. And one of the reasons that their budget has been cut is that the people who benefit and enjoy from national parks, and uh, uh, we don't have the authority as the District of Columbia Senators to make sure that those federal agencies that our state would depend on and benefit from are adequately funded. So let's talk, this bill does not transfer any land uh, ownership of national parks that will be located in the new state to the district. If a move was ever contemplated, at least there would be senators at the federal level and a voting member of Congress to make sure that the federal interests and the district interests were equalized in any such a transfer. But this doesn't do any of that. This is about the getting Congress out of our local affairs and making sure that those of us who vote here vote not just for shadow senators or a non-voting delegate to the House or a shadow representative, but vote for federal representatives who can have an impact on national policy. So that if you have concerns about the way the federal government manages the National Park Service, you will finally have an elected official accountable to you, elected by you, who will also have the ability to influence the national budget in ways that right now we can't. And let me just say, I'm not intending to bash the federal government. I'm not saying that at all. I think if you talk to the officials that we're talking to, they would tell you they, want, they don't want to maintain it. Um, and, and let me also say, all of our green space, almost all of it is owned by the federal government. <clears throat> we have many people that are asking, our city is growing, we have more children, they want more playgrounds. We're looking at a park that's owned by the federal government now to try to build a playground downtown. There is no playground downtown for kids. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of quality of life thing that we are talking about. We don't want Washington to become a Boston. But I wanted to also mention, too, that the gentleman asked Stand about up, what's different in this movement. Some years ago, there was a delegation of which one of them I led. We went on Capitol Hill, and we spoke about these same issues. So I want to see that this is definitely going to be an inroad into what we're trying to do. But some of the information I find as a commissioner out here working the streets, as you mentioned, grassroots, we know what's going on. I have talked to Park Service, Park Rangers. I know what's going on in my community and somewhat throughout the wards in this community. So it's a little insulting to sit here and hear this information. You are not even aware that we really know what's going on in our community. Well, of course you know what's going on in your communities, and that's why we want you involved in this effort. But we're talking about transforming our relationship with the federal government, transforming the way the Park Service uh, is funded. It, it's really statehood does nothing except enhance the sovereignty that we have over our own community and equalize uh, our relationship with the federal government so that we could deal with them on a, uh, a different level. Uh, I was an ANC commissioner for 10 years and had a Fort Circle Park in my district uh, and most recently got involved in a situation involving a concert series at those same Fort Reno Park. And we had this conflict and we had to rely on effective ANC representatives and so forth because the national government is not funding the national agency that deals with the national parks adequately. That is a problem, and it is a problem at the national level, a national level that we in the District of Columbia are not represented at. So it's not that we, we of course we recognize that you're engaged in these areas, but this is about giving you as a, a commissioner of a new state the resources you need at the federal level that we can't give you right now because as shadow senators, we can't direct real resources and funding at the federal level. So somebody said, will it make a difference in the bottom line in our area? Yeah, when we start Start revitalizing the national parks with that's federal land that should be getting federal dollars that they're just not right now. Okay. Councilwoman, did you want to did you want to respond? Um, not so much to My respond, feet. but really to um, please, please go so up to the mic. echo what, what I'm what I'm hearing, and it just seems that one of the okay, all right. One of the things that I'm hearing loud and clear is that 
We, the District of Columbia, want to know what are our boundaries, right. what do we think we own, what does the federal government really own, and it's a very natural question. Um, it's natural, but at the same time, I think today we're talking about the governance aspect. And so in order to talk about boundaries and the lists, or to articulate a list of what we, what we own, I think it would take a little more. Um, time and if I heard the panel um, correctly, the commission is saying that they will have that information for uh, digestion. In is that going to be in one of the subgroups where yes, we we'll, all there eight wards? Maybe there will be a map. Okay, it'll be a map, and I would also suggest um, for edification purposes that we would also have a list of what this land body is. You know, people want to know, you know, what does this really mean? Does this mean that little park that I've played in or my, my son has played in or just what? what? What does it really mean? And then what are the responsibilities for the property as well? So. Yeah, and I would agree with the councilwoman that these are not only natural issues, they're important issues. So I encourage everybody here to come Thursday night to Gallaudet and sign up for one of the working groups so that we have your input. I mean, that's the whole idea of being here tonight, and that's the idea to get together on Thursday is to engage you so we know what's going on in the neighborhood and we know that your interests are represented. This is my last question. Oh, and it's Commissioner, good. to go back and just say one thing? Sure. Uh, one is that... Um, Hi, Eugene Kinlow. Um, we're talking a lot about maps, and let me just tell you, there's one body or one group here in the D.C. government that's got great expertise in working on maps, and that's the Office of Planning. So we've been getting support. You don't see it right now, but the Office of Planning has been working on a variety of maps and a number of scenarios that anticipate what a federal, a, a contracted federal district would look like. And, uh, I mean, you know, they're experts, they're land use planners, they're architects, and they have run through a number of scenarios. Now, the body that is responsible is the commission. The commission will be evaluating a number of those recommendations, and I'm sure that they're going to be sharing those recommendations uh, with the rest of the groups to get your input on. Uh, there's a tremendous, I mean, there's a large amount of, of federal parkland in the district, and I think that what we do is we think about the good examples some of us, and some of us think about the bad example. Some I've heard in the back, well, you know, the Arboretum. Yeah, that's a great example of, of national parkland. But on my side of town, if you go to Shepherd Parkway and you see what happens or around maybe some things behind Fort Grebel or other places, it's a little uneven. Uh, there's an opportunity to, to talk about what that looks like once we make Washington, D.C. a state and, and negotiate with the federal government uh, further down the line. I have just this last question and suggestion. I'd like to know, you're saying that when we go to the polls in November, if we're going to be on that ballot. How are we getting the information out to the registered voters in the District of Columbia now? Are you just waiting to that time? Or are you no. sending email, I mean, mail out, I mean, before we get to the polls, so a lot of people be aware of what, what we're really trying to move, the movement we are really trying to go for. The, the first answer to that question is hopefully with a lot of help from you and everybody else in this room. It's going to take more than just the yes. It's yes, it is. Advertisement. It's going to take TV. Yes. It's going to take mail, just like we do with voting for the mayor, the president. It's going to take all that in order for some people, because some people don't listen to news. Some people don't listen to to go on Facebook like older senior citizens, they don't understand the internet. So it's going to take that. And I would hope that y'all are in preparation of sending out hard copy to people so they will be aware of this movement by and statehood. We are. And that's why we have these working groups that we're going to kick off on Thursday. And that's why we want you to be part of this effort. Then, this is just a suggestion. Then, then we're going to be off to a good start. Well, well, let me just it. say, the first thing that we have to do, uh, we have to get the Board of Elections to certify this question for the ballot. So everything we are doing now, we are trying to get to a July 8th. We have to have our petition to the Board of Elections by July 8th for the to, to make the November ballot. 
until we get that information to the Board of Election, after July 8th is when the campaign will really start. And, and you're right, Paul, funding is a missing piece of yeah, the puzzle Yeah, there will be right funding. It will, be, it, it will have to be an all-out campaign. That's why we have the All Eight Wards campaign. I mean, it would be great if we could get 100 people in each ward to work on this. It, it's going to take a lot. What we're trying to do, as I said earlier, we're trying to do in six months what they did in three years. So it, it is a heavy lift. But it was pointed out to us that we have a window of opportunity. We missed it in 2008. We don't want to miss it in 2016. Commissioner from White City. I've got two questions. One, um, first of all, I'm excited that this is happening. I, to use a proactive, coordinated strategy to, to take to move us to Swift State, I think is a, is a great opportunity. So thank you for taking the lead on this. Um, First of all, I, for, from our perspective as commissioners, to message this out to our constituents, they're going to ask two questions. They're going to ask a couple of questions. One, what are the pros to this? What are the cons? And 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 how is it going to look? How is it going to look once we're once we are a state? How is our governance going to change? What? Are, how are we going to be represented in the in the process? Uh, the second thing I would suggest is, um, if you're mounting an all-out campaign. Uh, for all of you to spread out and come to the commission meetings, Nancy commission meetings, would be a great opportunity. I know uh, um, Franklin came to ours before, we talked about it briefly. I think to, to really roll this up, people should spread out and come to those meetings and, and really really talk to people. Because then, because rather than us come to you, if you came to these meetings, you really, probably would, would serve a lot of people if we could try to get you on the agenda. Um, so thank you for, for doing this. And I'm, I'm not going to be able to come to the meeting on Thursday because we do actually have our ANC commission meeting. So, but I'm, but I'm on board. Thank you thank very you. much. The, the, one of the reasons why the draft constitution as a starting point is so important is that we wanted to get the word out that right now the constitution that's currently in draft form that we want all this comment, input, and public engagement on does not dramatically change the structure of the government. There will be a unified executive. There will be a legislative body that will look a lot like our current legislative body. ANC commissioners will go from a statutory office to a constitutional office. The State Board of Education will remain. Uh, the elected attorney general that we now elect will continue to be elected. So we're not necessarily proposing a dramatic shift uh, unless we hear from people that we really need something like that from the state of New Columbia to the current government of the District of Columbia. The big change that we're trying to get is the obstructionist Congress that has to uh, approve laws or can overturn them against our wishes. The Congress that has done a bad job of moving our budgets along, we take them out of that process. That is the big structural change of this Constitution. And then finally, uh, becoming equal federal citizens means that we get equal federal representation, which hopefully means that we'll finally get equal federal resources. Those are the big changes, but we're not looking to radically reform the structure of the local government. Uh, and you know what? Uh, when, when someone talked about the finances a little bit earlier, when the mayor and the CFO and Councilmember Evans and the chairman go to Wall Street, you know what the Wall Street analysts say about us, about our city? Our city has balanced this budget for the past 21 years. Our city is in good financial shape. But what holds, holds our bond rating down is the fact that we have the people up on the hill that can reach in and change our budget at any time. It is the uncertainty that Congress imposes over our budget. It's, it affects our bond rating. And so the mayor has asked Councilmember Evans um, on that advocacy business committee, she asked him to chair that because she wants him to communicate to the public of what the financial impact is to the city. I mean, it's small things like that. When you say, well, how does it affect us? It affects us in a lot of ways that we don't even think about. 
question. Um, yes, you mentioned that um, this whole idea was looked at by constitutional scholars and legal scholars, etc. Yes. Who are these scholars, and what did they use for the basis of their decisions? And do you have copies of any briefs supporting them? Original. Thank you. Um, I can tell you who the scholars are. We have um, Professor Viet Dean from Georgetown University. We have Professor Spencer Overton from George Washington University. We have Fred Cook, who is a distinguished lawyer here in town and is also a law professor at Howard University. We have the Dean Shelley Broderick of this law school. University of the District of Columbia. Um, we have uh, uh, Senator Strauss came in and uh, gave us his insights. We have John Bowker that used to work with, uh, he's with Aaron Fox and used to work with uh, Congresswoman Norton. Um, we have uh, Richard Shore who is with the law firm, the Gibbert Law Firm. Um, it's a list that goes on and on. And, and, and the ethics. They're supporting uh, documents. Well, uh, the, the, you, know, you know what we have um, in the book, we have two papers in the Constitution, and basically those are the legal justifications, and it explains uh, all of our justifications of why we need a new Constitution, what the process needs to be, all of that. It's all it's three pieces in that book. Yeah, no, but I was just looking for for a legal uh, on statehood or the language of the Constitution. Oh. There are several legal um, statehood based on the partition by shrinking the seat of government has been determined to be constitutional uh, by many many scholars uh, going back to nineteen. Uh, Jamie Raskin, who's about to become uh, a congressman from the 8th District of Maryland, uh, in the Harvard Law Review, published a very detailed uh, legal brief that outlines all of the constitutionality arguments of stated. Real simple, the Constitution says that there has to be a seat of government, it has a maximum size but not a minimum size, and Congress gets to have plenary power over said federal district. So by shrinking the federal district to the part that's exclusively federal, uh, we are preserving that intent uh, of Congress under the Constitution. The Constitution also says that Congress is empowered to admit new states, uh, statehood by going through Congress, even though we are initiating the petition ourselves, uh, follows that province of the Constitution. And in terms of historical and legal precedent, this model of not waiting for the Enabling Act but beginning the petition on ourselves dates back to the earliest days of our republic. The Tennessee plan actually originates from the residents of the Southwest Territory in the Fourth Congress, we're now on the 114th, in 1795 and 1796, uh, after unsuccessfully petitioning to join the Union as a state that they tried to name Franklin, decided to convene themselves as a state, they had a state constitution. They created a, what was then the territorial legislature, declared themselves to be the state legislature, and in fact they even elected two shadow U.S. senators, the very first shadow U.S. senators in U.S. history, that went and petitioned the Fourth Congress uh, and were seated uh, while the admission petition of Tennessee was debated. Uh, throughout the early part of that century, as slave states sought to block the admission of new free states, other territories, particularly Michigan, Oregon, California, and Minnesota, also used that same plan of declaring statehood in advance of congressional authorization to join the Union. Uh, so we are in good company. Uh, and then in the last 20th century, the territory of Alaska followed that same plan and was actually the first to uh, add a shadow U.S. representative to that plan, uh, declared themselves to be a state, sent a congressional delegation, adopted a state constitution, filed their petition. Um, this is a tried and true method that history has shown works. But to answer your question about a legal brief or any of that, we don't have that. These are, these are constitutional law, law professors, and we didn't ask them to write a brief to us. What they said, they were stand, you know, what they, we had 
several meetings, um, several, several meetings, and they, they have Supreme Court practices. They assure us that we are standing on sound legal grounds. They've met with the mayor. They have assured her. Paul has been in meetings. They have assured us that we are standing on sound legal grounds. But do we have a piece of paper to, that they wrote a brief on? No, we don't have that. I have an email, but... <laughs> what, what, but if you're looking for sources of constitutional authority and legal analysis, you can find them in the most recent record of the most recent hearing that the United States Senate conducted uh, on statehood, in which you will find these law review articles, these legal briefs, and uh, testimony As from these guys, professor in, including Din Professor Din. Uh, so statehood has been debated by Congress, the statehood bill, that uh, is currently pending in Congress uh, has been the subject of a hearing and you will find supporting legal authority including those scholarly legal writings in that congressional record. And just so you know, Professor Din was also uh, the Assistant Attorney General uh, for the United States under President Bush. So, uh, you know, he, he came out of the Justice Department um, and happens to be a Republican, a conservative Republican, that's on our side and is taking the lead. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, this is for Senator Brown and Paul, uh, Senator Strong. This is about financing the statehood thing. You can come to the side with me because I keep hearing you saying sovereign, and I have something to say to you that may not be for work to help you get funded. And I say, I'm sovereign. Then I can go to my emperor on y'all behalf, but we got to talk on the side, because it should. We hold that great seal for the entire America, okay? So we got to talk, because it's that time, and the people are suffering. I know Ms. Bonds for a long time, my friend Tim Donnie, and the so I know many of you in here that come across me, like Muhammad, they know about my business. And I'm not trying to start now, but I really want to support the District of Columbia and my people. I think it's time. We got an endless amount of money. Heard you mention Wall Street. Got what they want. Got what y'all need. We just need to talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, Commissioner Muhammad. Um, also, in your changing of the Constitution that you're pro proposing, I hope you have in it also that black people or African Americans, the 15th <coughs> Amendment, do not have to be approved every 25 years to vote, to strike that out of the Constitution of the United States of America. That every 25 years, Mr. Bush was the last one to approve us to be able to vote. So we could really be full citizens. Status. I hope you put that in the Constitution, a change that you're making. Well, you, 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 come, you come commissioner and you put it in the Constitution. You're a delegate. All right, um, seeing no more questions, with appreciation for all of your time, let me thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank we you. want to welcome you to this effort. We want to welcome you to this struggle. And we want to welcome you as uh, part of this uh, ongoing initiative. I hope to see you all on May 12th and at the uh, subsequent meetings. And thank you all for the service you provide to uh, us and our community. Can I say one last thing? Rachel, will you raise your hand? Denisha and Karen Zolget, these are the people in our office that uh, need to be recognized and also that you can touch base with on these issues. Thanks. So if you're in the room, please go and pick up your copy of the draft constitution. And if you're watching us at home, go to statehood.dc.gov and download your own copy. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned.